morning everyone. It's great to be here to share Sunday morning service with you on Sunday, March the 21st. Today we're looking at the third of uh, Joseph's temptations and I think there's a lot for us all to learn, especially for me, as you'll perhaps see later on. But we're going to begin with a call to worship. As so often it's from a psalm, but it seems particularly appropriate for Joseph because as you know, his brothers seized him and put him in a pit. And this one talks about being in a desolate pit. And I'm very glad that Tina's here to help me with the call to worship. And please join in yourselves as well. So here we go as we prepare ourselves to worship God, to open up our lives to him and to receive the help that we need. So the psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray on after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. And yet it is a good thing, isn't it, to count God's blessings. We're now going to share in a prayer, and again, Tina will help me. The words will be on the screen. So please join in. It's a prayer really for the, the beginning of the day. O Lord, our Heavenly Father Almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same of thy mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance, to do always that is righteous in thy sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And uh, I'm sure there may, would be many days when Joseph would have loved to be able to pray uh, that he might not run into any kind of danger. His life, especially the early years, was fraught with danger. But Joseph knew that he had a great God. We constantly hear about how God was with him. And the first hymn we're going to sing together is a wonderful hymn, How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hand has made, then sings my soul, my Saviour God, to thee, how great thou art.
together and it's to be found in Genesis 42 and we're going to read the first 17 verses. Now I had a real difficulty deciding which few verses to read because we ought at least to read chapters 42, chapter 43, chapter 44 and chapter 45 because they're all part of the same story. They're part of the story of Joseph's brothers coming down to Egypt to find food, Joseph recognising them, and the whole unravelling of what goes on then. But in a sense, we ought to begin even earlier, right at the beginning of the story, because that's where it all begins. And we're going to be thinking about the temptation to revenge. But I've contented myself with these few verses, but I hope if you have time you'll be able to read the whole saga. But here we go. When Jacob, who of course was Joseph's father, as well as the father of his other eleven brothers, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. 
as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognised them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognised his brothers, they did not recognise him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you've come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your, your servants were twelve brothers, the son of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, it's just as I told you, you're spies, and this is how you will be tested. As sure as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. When Joseph was put in that pit, early on in the story, he was 17. He's now 37. Of course, he's gone through many experiences. He was not left in the pit to die, as had originally been planned, but sold to the Midianites. They bought him as a slave and sold him on to Potiphar. And then, as Joseph rose to power and influence in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and because Joseph refused, but she accused him, he's thrown into prison, where he thrives again and rises to the top, the jailer leaving him in charge. And because of that, he comes across two of Pharaoh's high officials, the baker and the butler, who have disappointed Pharaoh, offended him in some way, so that they too have been put in prison. And after they've been there quite a while, they have a dream and Joseph interprets the dream and says, the butler, you're going to be restored to favour and the baker, you're going to be killed. And he says to the butler, remember me when you're free. Tell Pharaoh about me so that I can be freed also. But the butler forgets for two years and then when Pharaoh needs someone to interpret his dreams and all his magicians and wise men fail to do so, the butler suddenly has one of those light bulb moments. He remembers Joseph. Joseph's brought out of prison, interprets Pharaoh's dream and is put in charge of the whole arrangement. They need to gather the grain for seven years when there's going to be a bumper harvest, build silos, store it safely. And then when the seven years of famine come, then Joseph will be in charge of selling it. He's second in command throughout all the land of Egypt. Amazing success story. But through all that time, he was carrying this huge burden. How could his brothers do this to him? In disposing of him, threatening to kill him and then selling him as a slave, they had broken very strong family ties. They should have protected their brother, not treated him in this despicable way. And even though God has been with him and led him to power through all of this, Joseph has carried that burden. And it would be very, very easy, would it not, given that story, for Joseph to have allowed revenge to fester in his heart, to build up, to grow, to magnify, so that when he sees his brothers, when they come from Canaan to Egypt to buy food because they're starving in Canaan, and he recognises them, how easy it would have been for him to want revenge. And if you've never been to the end of the story, 
then you might well think that this is what Joseph is up to now. Because he toys with his brothers. He recognises them. They don't recognise him. Of course, he's dressed as an Egyptian. How could they? He was a young lad when they left. Now he's grown up. A man. He's powerful. They think he's been a slave somewhere all these years. How would they recognise him? But Joseph recognises them and accuses them of being spies. And he begins to tease out from them the story of what happened in the past. Just begins to. And he learns, as they tell him, about Benjamin, Jake, Joseph's own brother from the same mother, who was very precious to his father. Is Joseph seeking revenge? He's showing his power. He puts them in prison. He's teasing them in many ways about their fate. For three days they're in this terrible prison as he had been in a pit and they do not know the outcome. We say in the English language revenge is sweet and once it gets inside you it can be very very hard to get rid of it. But what is revenge? Why is it so powerful? One of uh, my favourite authors, who was a, a, a very famous Methodist preacher in the last century, wrote a book called He is Able. It was referring to the fact that Jesus is able to help us in all kinds of human crises that we may face. And this is what he has to say about revenge. The most difficult wounds, the wounds that refuse to heal and take a constant toll of health and strength are the wounds deliberately given. The thrust that was meant to be a thrust, the injury consciously and cruelly aimed for, the stab that was planned and had venom in it, these are the wounds which hurt and burn and throb and fester, which nurture the passion for vengeance and make one furtive, bitter and hateful. Does it surprise anyone if a man whose daughter has been foully assaulted should seek revenge upon the lustful beast who caused her degradation? The passage for vengeance, revenge, is grounded in human nature. It's a deep elemental desire known to primitive and civilised people alike and burns in the dark recesses of our heart. It's a compound of wounded self-regard and anger. Wounded self-regard and anger. Now, I don't know whether it will surprise you or not, but there's a vengeful streak in me. Just driving to do this recording this afternoon, going down a dual carriage, a road with two lanes of traffic, plenty of warning, 400 yards ahead, one was going to be closed down. So most of the traffic got into one line, but several vehicles carried on driving through instead of waiting. And that annoys me, you know. I think it's mean when people do that. And so I was quite pleased to find that as I got to the traffic lights, three of those four vehicles had not been allowed to rejoin the line. That kind of gave me a good feeling. And yet I know it's wrong. I wonder if you ever experience those kinds of vengeful thoughts. Joseph might well have done so. But you know, revenge doesn't do what we want it to do. We want to, we feel revenge because we want to see those who've damaged us put down, at least experiencing the pain that we've experienced. We want them to learn so that they don't do it again. But revenge rarely works. Rather, it spreads hate and anger in us. It tends to exaggerate the evil that's happened to us or those we love, and it multiplies the effects. I wonder if you remember that Jesus said on one occasion, you say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, 
But I say to you, love your enemies. Now, Jesus was quoting from the Old Testament. And there, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was to stop revenge multiplying. Israel and other nations discovered that if one tribe was offended and took revenge on another tribe, that tribe would then take more revenge and it would grow and grow and grow until huge damage could be done to many, many people. So the law said only one eye for an eye. Not two, not three, just one. And if somebody knocks a tooth out, all you can have is to knock one of their teeth out not their whole mouthful. It was to limit revenge. Because if revenge is unchecked, it spreads and grows like a deadly cancer. And it destroys the person who seeks revenge. So how can we get rid of the desire for revenge? How can we handle the hurt and the pain that we experience if we've been abused or damaged, or maligned, or mocked, let alone seriously injured. Are we trapped? Was the pit Joseph was put in as a young man the only pit he was in? Or was he in a far deeper and darker pit, the pit where he couldn't escape from the need to revenge his brothers? Well, he certainly had every motive to seek revenge. He had seen not only his own life damaged, but knew that his apparent death would have caused his father terrible anguish. And Joseph and his father were very close. And often the revenge that we find hardest to deal with is not when someone's hurt us, but hurt those that we love and are close to. And Joseph knew his brothers had damaged his father for decades. He'd had time for that revenge to breed. He had the motive and the cause to seek revenge. And he also had the means because he was so powerful. He could say to his guards, put them in prison, and they were put in prison. There was no high court to appeal to. Joseph had all the power. I've mentioned before that in one way, the thing I'm proudest about to live in Coventry is because of what happened in the war when the cathedral and much of the city had been destroyed on that dreadful night by those German bombs and the next morning Provost Howard, instead of encouraging people to seek revenge, formed a cross with the charred beams and taught people there and then that they must say, Father forgive. And out of that has grown a huge worldwide movement based in Coventry for peace and reconciliation. That was an amazing thing to do on those very dark days after that bombing. It was courageous because he knew many people would be wanting revenge. But he said, no, not revenge, but forgiveness is the way of Christ. He had the motive to seek revenge, but do you know what? He didn't have the means. How could he have got back to those German bombers or the German soldiers the other side of the channel? He couldn't do it. But Joseph not only had the motive, he had the means to seek for vicious revenge. And so he puts the silver that was meant to pay for the grain in the, his brother's sacks, they discover it, they go home, they come back, they bring the silver with them. He tries another ploy, puts the silver back and the silver cup. And when they're into a day's journey, he sends his soldiers after them, discovers it, brings them all back, goes through all kinds of rigmaroles. Is he seeking revenge? Or is actually a process going on whereby God is speaking into his life about learning to forgive. Of discovering that being in a place of power and imposing revenge on others isn't as sweet as you might think. And as the story unfolds, perhaps we never know whether there was revenge in his heart and mind to start with, but what we do discover is that by the end, it's not revenge, but blessing that he wants to give his brothers. 
It's not holding a vicious grudge against them, justified as that might well have seemed. It's about offering forgiveness and enabling restoration and life to flow. How did Joseph manage to do that? I think we get the clue later on in the story. In chapter 45, Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Make everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? You can see what was on his mind, can't you? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. The brothers anticipated terrible revenge. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will not be ploughing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. What they had intended for evil, God had wrapped himself around and turned into good. And Joseph knew this. He knew that God was a God who was sovereign. That he could work through all the plots and machinations and evil that men can do to one another and bring good for it, from it. And so Joseph could let go of his need for revenge because he knew that God was greater than the evil that had been done and that God had blessed him. Paul, when he wrote to the Romans, said, don't seek for revenge. And he quoted from the book of Proverbs about not wanting revenge and so heaping coals of fire on those who damaged us, not in the sense of destroying them, uh, but perhaps of purifying them. And so Joseph, knowing that God is in control, knowing that God is a God of justice, knowing that God will put things right, knowing that God is at work to bring good even out of difficult and dangerous and abusive situations, can let go of his need for revenge. It's not easy. We've seen it can be a long process. Perhaps if the brothers had not shown remorse and regret about what had happened, Joseph might have gone through with his revenge, but he saw God was working in their lives too. But it's never easy when you've been badly damaged to let go of the desire for revenge. But one thing helps me even more than the story of Joseph, and that's this. One of the powerful things that put Jesus on the cross was that those religious leaders were seeking revenge. Time and time again in discussions, Jesus had been able to kind of outwit them and show them up for what they were. Not pious, godly people, but people seeking their own ends. And they grew tired of this. And they plotted for his death because they wanted revenge. And we always need to remember that revenge was one of the key elements that nailed Jesus to that cross. They wanted to get even with the one who had caused them hurt and lowered their standing among the population. Revenge put Jesus on the cross. But although revenge put Jesus on the cross, what did he say? He didn't say, Father, Send angels to destroy them. No, he said, Father, forgive them because they don't fully understand what they are doing. But we need to understand 
But if we hold on to revenge, it puts Jesus on the cross. But we also need to know that if we hold on to revenge, it damages us even more than those we seek revenge over. As I said towards the beginning of this service, in English we say, revenge is sweet. I think it's more true to say that revenge is a poisoned pill with a sugar-coated exterior. It may seem as though it's sweet, as though it will release the pain within us, but once the sweetness is gone, the bitterness, the hatred, damages us even more than those we want revenge over. Forgiveness, restoration, is the way of Joseph and the way of Jesus, because they both knew they could trust God to deal with those who had wronged them and to bring good out of evil. As Paul also said in Romans, God is at work in all things for those who love God. God is at work in all things for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Let's try to release to God any sense of revenge that clings to us and any desire to gain revenge over other people. Joseph shows us it's tough, but he shows us too, it can be done. And so we come to our time of prayer, our prayer especially for other people, but we begin with prayer for ourselves. Heavenly Father, we often pray, forgive us our trespasses, our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lord, many of us carry hurt and pain, perhaps from our very earliest years, and we can't get rid of it. It's always there, and we think, if only we could get our own back, we would find relief. And yet deep down we know that that's the enemy's lie. And so we ask, Lord, that you would give us deep grace to be able to release to you those who have damaged us. Father, cleanse our hearts so that we no longer need to cling to the hurt and the hate that we've experienced. Set us free by the resurrection power of Jesus to live in his freedom day by day. But Lord, we also come to pray for those whose lives have been badly damaged, as Joseph's was, by all kinds of evil and corruption. We pray for those who have been damaged, as Joseph was, in a domestic context. For those children, those wives, even husbands, whose lives emotionally and mentally and even physically have been distorted and destroyed by the nastiness, the cruelty, the oppression and the abuse of other people. We pray for such people that you will give them a place of safety. And we thank you for all who run places of refuge and protect the vulnerable. But we ask for more than that. We pray that you would give them understanding friends and family members who can be with them as they work through the destructive force of evil that has happened to them. And we pray that you would protect them from the ongoing damage of the need to seek revenge. Father, we ask that we might be a people who are like a light set on the hill. As you cleanse us from the need to desire revenge, 
to justify ourselves, to gain the victory over others. We pray that you would also give us tender hearts and lives that are rooted in your love, that we may be available as people seek to work through the terrible legacy of the damage that may have been done to them. Father, we thank you for Joseph. We thank you that he not only rose to power in Egypt, but that he rose in power over the darkness of evil that had been done to him. And we pray that with Jesus' help, we may join him in that place of victory. So hear our prayers, because we come in Jesus' name. Amen. And our closing hymn is uh, one of those really early Graham Kendrick ones, so well known. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. And it goes on to say, by the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory blaze spirit blaze set our
thank you for sharing in this service and uh, we wish you a very happy Sunday, however you're going to be spending it. And now we join together in saying the words that unite us in Christ, the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.